125 million years ago, a swampy forest in what's now Lebanon was abuzz with bugs of all kinds. Mosquitoes and flies filled the air. Giant predatory water bugs lurked in the depths, while millipedes and cockroaches scuttled along the forest floor. And on one of the many trees in this dark, dense forest was an unlucky beetle, covered in a sticky yellow goo that would eventually harden into amber. This was a classic case of being in exactly the wrong place at exactly the wrong time, because at this point, amber was pretty new. To date, paleontologists have only found a handful of amber deposits older than this poor beetle's final resting place. But everything was about to change. Suddenly, amber began popping up everywhere, entombing animals like insects, lizards, and even ammonites. This kicked off a period of 54 million years, known as the Cretaceous Resonance Interval, preserving amber in hundreds of locations across the world. In Lebanon alone, over 8,000 fossil specimens have been found from only 10 kilograms of studied amber. It was a gooey, gummy point in Earth's history. And then amber suddenly disappeared for another 20 million years. So we have to ask, what exactly made this time period so very, very sticky? Now the process of forming amber is finicky, and it requires a few specific conditions. The first is that there must be plants that produce resin, the gooey stuff that eventually turns into amber. Resin is a unique substance. It's thicker than sap and isn't something that all plants can make. If there's one group of plants that's well known for making resin, it's the conifers, which includes things like pine trees, spruces, and monkey puzzle trees. And although they first showed up during the Carboniferous period, around 320 million years ago, conifers exploded in diversity during the end of the Jurassic and early Cretaceous periods. Suddenly, these resin-producing trees dominated the landscape in a way they hadn't before. So the first condition for amber formation was met. There were a lot of trees that could produce resin, but that alone isn't enough. Something has to trigger the plant to actually make that resin. See, trees produce resin in response to injury or illness. It seals over cuts and holes and is even antimicrobial and antifungal. And of course, it's also anti-beetle and anti-insect since they get encased in it and die. So resin is less like tree blood and more like dangerously sticky tree band-aids. These band-aids are ultimately temporary. As the plant heals, the hardening resin plug is pushed out in a process called pitching out, effectively removing any infection or unlucky insect along the way. Then for the resin to turn into amber, it can't just linger above the ground. Most resin decays or burns. In order to fossilize and change into amber, it needs to be covered in sediment and preserved. So to create amber, you need to hurt the right type of tree and bury its discarded band-aids. But even then, preservation of amber is still rare. So to produce the vast amber deposits of the Cretaceous resinous interval, you would need to injure whole forests. So who or what was hurting all these trees? One potential suspect is, well, the planet. The Cretaceous period was very warm, with high levels of carbon dioxide that trapped solar energy. All that extra energy may have caused extra hurricanes, which uproot trees, remove their leaves, and even snap off whole limbs. And that sort of damage can cause trees to produce a lot of resin in response. But the world wasn't just warm. The atmosphere also had more oxygen than it does today which means there were a lot more wildfires. And the trees that survived these fires didn't do so unscathed. To heal themselves, they would have produced large amounts of resin. But though it certainly contributed, scientists don't think that the climate alone was responsible for the resinous interval. That's because the resinous interval has another strange pattern. It seems to have been regional and patchy, and most of these patches have been found in the Northern Hemisphere. See, high oxygen and carbon dioxide are global problems. If they were the sole cause, we should find a ton of resin across the globe. A pattern of damage in only part of the planet suggests the trees were being injured by something more local. Which brings us back to that seemingly innocent beetle, or technically, some of its relatives. These are some of the oldest known members of the Scolatini, commonly called bark beetles. 
Today, there are over 6,000 described species. And some bark beetles have such a specialized set of adaptations that they've earned themselves the name ambrosia beetles. They eat only ambrosia fungus, which they farm themselves by burrowing into trees and planting the fungal spores on the walls of their tunnels. The beetles even tend to their crops by weeding out competing fungi and bacteria. And when it's time for ambrosia beetles to move on and establish a new colony, they bring their fungal gardens with them. Ambrosia beetles have evolved special pockets or divots on their bodies called mycangia, which are humidity and temperature controlled to keep fungal spores alive between their homes, which is great for the beetles, but not for the trees. Ambrosia fungus is one of a tree's worst enemies. For them, it's a terrible parasite that spreads throughout the wood. Infected trees may wilt, have stunted growth, or even die. And of course, in response to this infection, those trees release resin. For years, paleontologists suspected that this was the cause of the Cretaceous resinous interval, damage from ambrosia fungus spread by diligent beetle farmers. But in this last decade, we've realized that that can't be true for a few different reasons. The first is that those ancient beetles probably didn't have the close relationship with fungi that their descendants do today. It's not clear exactly when farming evolved, but mycangia and other physical adaptations only seem to have evolved around 54 million years ago, long after the end of the Cretaceous. The other problem is that when you look at Cretaceous amber, you find very few members of Scolatini. So even if they were farming fungus earlier than expected, they simply weren't abundant enough to be responsible. Which brings us back again to that beetle trapped in amber. It seems that for years, this poor beetle's family was framed. But by who? Thanks to the work of paleontologists and entomologists, we now suspect someone else a cousin of sorts, one with its own relationship to ambrosia fungus. These are the ship timber beetles, which are in a totally different family from the bark beetles and are named for their annoying habit of putting holes in the sides of ships. Of course, in the absence of ships, these beetles were perfectly happy to bore into trees. But just boring into wood is more annoying for trees than devastating and adult ship timber beetles only bore into wood so that they can deposit their eggs. The larvae live in the wood, but the adults fly away. The fungus can often end up in the boreholes too, which scientists initially thought was just an accidental infection, with the fungus taking advantage of the holes bored by larvae. So wouldn't that make ship timber beetles just like bark beetles? Innocent bystanders in the battle between Cretaceous trees and whatever was causing them to produce resin? Well. No, see adult ship timber beetles actually leave something else behind along with their eggs, the spores of fungi and yeast, which they carry in a special slot on their abdomen. And these become a feast of ambrosia fungus for their larvae, even though they don't farm it in the way ambrosia beetles do. In fact, this may be how the relationship between the ambrosia beetles and their fungi first evolved, with an accidental benefit soon turning into full agriculture. But the realization that the mothers are deliberately introducing the fungus makes it more likely it was ship timber beetles that were actually behind the spread of the fungus. They weren't bystanders, but instead disease vectors. And unlike ambrosia beetles, ship timber beetles are far more common in Cretaceous amber. So paleontologists originally had the right fungus, but the wrong beetle. While research is always ongoing, it seems for the moment that we've identified the Cretaceous culprit. Yet, both ambrosia and ship timber beetles are still around today, and the Cretaceous resinous interval stopped in, well, the Cretaceous. So why didn't it and the accompanying spike in amber preservation continue? Well, like we said before, amber is finicky. You have to have a lot of different factors all working together in order to preserve large amounts of it, and beetle infestations are only one of many. The warm climate and high oxygen levels of the Cretaceous weren't around forever, and as the climate changed, so did the forests. New plants began to evolve, developing flowers and seeds, outcompeting the old conifer forests. Entire families of conifers went extinct or became a lot less abundant. Amber does still periodically show up in the fossil record after the Cretaceous, but not quite to the same extent. 
Instead, there are occasional big deposits like the Eocene Baltic Amber or the Miocene Amber of the Dominican Republic. And of course, resin is still around today. We even farm it ourselves to use in things like varnish and incense. But as it is, the perfect storm of climate, evolution, and environment that created the Cretaceous Resinous Interval eventually came to an end. And so too did its massive widespread amber deposits. There are still patches of amber through time, but nothing like the gooey golden forests of the Cretaceous. We may still have amber, but the world is now generally a lot less sticky. Today, trees are almost everywhere, but how and when did this happen? Learn more about the evolution of forests in our episode, When Trees Took Over the World. And we gotta stick together with this month's eontologists. Addie, Annie and Eric Higgins, Carl Wolfel, Jackie Scott Ralston, Jake Hart, John Davidson Ng, Juan M, Melanie Lamb Carnival, Nico Robin, Raphael Haas, Tony Dye, and Steve. Become an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons, and you can get fun perks like access to a monthly digital puzzle of paleo art commissioned just for eons. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more ancient adventures. Gosh, the first behind the scenes with the new set. Look at our new set. Ambrosia beetles. Can you see this piece of lint that's flying in the air? <laughs> oh my God. Okay, sorry. We're high def, we're not that high def. Okay, it went like straight, it was just as I was talking.